Welcome back to High Performance Computing, our part two of our lecture two on parallel programming with MPI. So the first part of the lecture really was considering scientific applications and the reasoning why we supposedly go for parallel computing. We had examples like perhaps a wave propagation on some ocean or basically alongside the coast of Iceland. So this already motivates a little bit that these are bigger problems, right? Simulating the human brain, as we have seen in the nest code or the terrestrial systems that covering a huge regional area maybe, and you want to have really detailed simulations of that space uh, requires lots of interactions between basically different parts of this parallel computing. And how you have done this basically, we have seen in the, is this so-called domain decomposition. So you kind of put the whole domain and cut it into little pieces. Of course, we will have subsequent lectures where we will, let's say more formalize this. We will also explain what the problems with that is, alluding a little bit already to ghost cells and so on. But I think this is something where this is much more advanced parallel programming with MPI. And this is really a basic lecture here today. But we also carried away the message that MPI is already a quite strong standard. It has conceptually, as we looked at it, a little bit like lots of um, collective operations where not only one processor and another processor is involved. Here we talk about having a bunch of processors involved, which are basically bound or grouped by a communicator. And we have different communicators. We come to this in the course as well, the Cartesian one, which is quite nicely fits to the idea of this wave propagation, perhaps on the ocean. But there are also other ideas how you do domain decomposition. And so also then you can create your own groups of actually processors talking to each other. And we have, of course, also typical send and receive operations. But um, basically, when you large scale programming, um, then basically often these collective operations come in really handy because you have to think about that the same application essentially is basically running on all the different processors. You just basically have the so-called rank information that we learned at the end of the part one that then really differentiates the processors between, let's say, rank zero and rank one, and then do different program logic. How that all looks like will be part of the second part now where we a little bit look on all of these conceptual aspects that we revealed about MPI in the first part, will be now put a little bit more into code. And while this lecture then basically stays with PowerPoint slides, there will be, of course, a practical lecture 2.1, where we'll demonstrate lots of these elements. Um, and also think about there was assignment one, where you basically also do a lot of these things with hands-on on the HPC machine. So let's go ahead and see how we can basically look a bit deeper into MPI. And this is really to understand um, essentially that we of course, firstly have to have the access to a cluster um, that is uh, pretty obvious. Um, in our case, it's a U-turn machine. Then we often use SSH to basically access a remote machine. That's what we did the last time in the practical lecture and before that already in one of the basic lectures. And then we checked already also the idea of using the module environment and essentially checking then what basically in types of, um, you know, MPI implementations exist on this machine. There's some parastation MPI sometimes as MPish, but we use basically open MPI in this course. And that's why basically this is something which of course you check first. So what is the MPI implementation you want to use? Um, <clears throat> then we already learned what the step one would be if you program it. And this means you have to go to the remote environment, um, basically checking then this, HP, this MPI. We do this in our course with the uh, workaround with Krafla if you're basically not in the university network. Otherwise, you can directly SSH into Uturn. So this is, of course, the first step, getting access to this HPC system. That's what we can conclude there. And then look that the environment is right. Um, that is basically there. Now, also the second part now surprise you that basically in order to create a parallel program, we have to basically start with a typical C program because every valid, let's say, um, parallel program in MPI should be also a valid C program in the end. 
Hence, we basically start here what we learned the last time in practical lecture 1.1, one, one, and then basically go from there in order to augment it now with basically MPI statements. But if you start from scratch, it makes sense to really have this Hello C program created um, that we used the last time. And if you remember, we then had the compiler that was creating then this Hello um, MP, uh, the Hello executable that we then were actually, um, yeah, executing, but had not really a complete parallel philosophy. We executed it four times, five times on different nodes, but still they were not interacting with each other. So in this sense, it was not really an MPI program. It was just hello world executed four times in parallel without any message interaction. So the idea now is to change that over the course of the next couple of lectures to really leverage, of course, the message passing in this MPI. And basically, what also is a bit surprising maybe is the idea for some students that basically the same MPI program is always there on these different processors. And now you would think if they all do the same thing, what's the point of doing parallel computing? Now think about that they do the same thing over different area or domain, which means the variables maybe have different data. Uh, one example would be propagating a wave here from one processor to another where the wave height is probably different. Although every processor has probably a wave height variable or something like this, but every processor at a certain time step over the domain in the ocean would have different data on this. And if you want to inform what the wave height was to propagate it over the, let's say domain, you maybe want to communicate this data to the other processor. It's a, a really a, a technique called single program multiple data. Now, <clears throat> the data exchange is often the key in the MPI. Hence, we use this a lot with the message passing interface to get data over to the other memories of the other processors. And with this, we have, let's say, of course, also um, different complex MPI structures for data types. And we have to specify how many of those go over the wire essentially to the other processor. And all of this will be basically then the the idea is how to use MPI. Um, however, there are also basic building blocks of using MPI all the time. MPI init, for instance, which always starts a so-called um, PAL computing environment, what we have to look. So identifying, of course, and also how what are the processes that are really needed. So we start with this a little bit to edit our text file that we know um, from the C program. If you remember, we had the include for including the IO library here or the header files and the main, which is really executed when you have this executable. And then we have this hello world, but we modify this now to really make a statement. If I have, let's say four processors, I want to know who I am I out of this. And <clears throat> there's a specific name for this. We call that rank and basically size will also tell us, okay, how many at all. So in our example, maybe four, and I want to have this hello world, but I know the identity of each processor, which would be essentially this rank information. But you see also here, there's nothing MPI specific. So this is a typical C program. We have to fill now, obviously, rank and size with some proper data. In the moment, this is, of course, always, let's say, undefined or uninitiated. So to jump now, basically, from this to a proper MPI, we have to include the MPI header and basically to have access to many of these different MPI functions in our so-called extended C program, I would call it. We had already defined the rank and size, but we have to also um, later fill that still with, with you know, values. What we don't here do yet, rather what we do is to create an MPI environment with MPI init and MPI finalize and every Basically, MPI program needs those two to really be an MPI program and the parallelization can only happening between those because with this, the parallel environment is created. So also this, of course, is still not really complete. Again, rank and size are not defined. So how we can define this? No surprise. The MPI standard gives you very much helper um, functions and you see here just two of them in the video from part one we have also seen you can even get the processor name where it's running which you also will use in your assignment 
But here we use the MPI com size of the so-called com world communicator. If you remember, that was the so-called world of communicators where basically every processor is in, right? And it's always defined like that. If you then basically go and create your own subgroups, communicators, Cartesian communicators, whatever, you can always fall back into the so-called MPI com world where all the processors will be in. And so if you go there, we basically get the size so we can determine how many processors are actually in, in one specific communicator. And we get basically the rank information. The rank is here, this process has a zero, one, two, et cetera. So it's a unique identifier for each of the processors being in a communicator. In other words, also that of course, depending on the communicator, you would have this rank information in different communicators. So you see here we have uh, ranks from zero up to nine, but here basically um, this 10 processors have been basically again chopped into different subgroups, two different communicators, and in each of the communicators we start again from zero up to four. So in other words, basically one processor is in MPI com world, but also in this perhaps subgroup communicator and has different ranks, of course, in different communicators, which is important and especially important when you think about that this is in a way the region of communication you're talking about. So in other words, also MPI always needs the communicator to know where I'm actually communicating. And this is an important part. And basically now we have filled the rank and size information so that basically during the runtime, we will fill this on the processors um, with some real values out of the MPI environment, and then can really answer this by saying the rank and size is defined. And we expect that this basically very little, if you want, it's a hello MPI application, um, will basically then have a correct outcome and will say um, basically, uh, these outcome here differently from all the different processors, right? And now the interesting part begins. You see, um, this is here now the practical example that I will also run for you in the practical lecture 2.1. But essentially you see that we have just one source code, right? The hello C um, with the same code for everyone. And still the rank then now and the size, the variables we get out of the MPI um, basically it gives us more information. While the size is obviously the same for this application because it's the size of the whole communicator, the rank information is now this unique identifier which enables us to really distinguish between the different processors and enable us that this output, although we programmed it in the same way, yeah, so it's same program, multiple data because we are the rank will be always you know, in different data from zero to four, uh, from zero to three, if you basically have four processors, for example. What remains the same is that it's the C program that needs compiling. And with the header information of MPIH, we need, of course, also an MPI library that should be installed before. And we are safe with this because we already know how this works with the module environment. We have used it now basically before with using the GNU and model load GNU and then open MPI and so forth. So that's where we are familiar with, and we know it's existing on Utune. So with this, we basically have the, the first building blocks to really thinking about that the compiling should work and we have the right libraries already loaded via the modules. And the modus operandi of compiling is essentially the same. Um, all you have to do is ensure, of course, that we have here the open MPI also loaded in the libraries. And then we have still, although it's an MPI program, a typical way how we did it the last time was MPI CC hello C. And optionally, we can do this minus O hello to get the executable. So you see, essentially, um, there's not much more happening, except that, of course, we need access to these different libraries. And here's an outdated part of practical lecture 0 0.2. So this was actually reflecting uh, practical lecture 1.1 now in the new slides apologize it is an old typo but essentially what we also said is and let us go back a little bit here um, we said we we basically have this scheduling script then that now will use this executable and will try to now run this mpi application on different processors 
Now, the interesting thing is, um, if you remember from the C code, if we go a little bit back to this, there's still no communication, right? If you remember from the conceptual elements we had in the first part, like MPI send, MPI receive for point-to-point -point communication, or MPI broadcast, MPI reduce, MPI scatter, MPI gather, there's nothing of this here. So in other words, all these processes live in the same communicator space, but they still don't really interact with each other. That makes it a very simple program and perhaps not, not really a very useful program, but at least it shows you that the MPI environment exists and the identity of these different processes. Once we have understood this identity of these different processes, then the communication exchange also will much more making sense. And I will demonstrate that later with a ping pong, right? Where you basically have, of course, an identity if you want to be the ping or the pong as a processor. And we use the rank information for actually finding out, and then we can send and receive and do the ping and the pong. Sounds a bit funny, but of course it is uh, basically fun along the way. Sometimes in parallel computing, um, you have to simplify wherever you can because these applications getting enormously complex and we build it here gradually step by step. So please always think about, you have to understand communicators first, you need to understand here the size of the communicators, it's incredibly important. You understand that you have different communicators perhaps, why MPI ComWorld is basically in every MPI application, but also means all processors are in. So you can create your own ones and we will do in subsequent lectures. Here, then the rank information with the MPI Com rank, which you also will use in your assignments, really, <clears throat> let's say relatively often to really get the message that the rank information is important. And it will be differently filled from the type of data given the, the run on the different processes. And this is an important part, how we can enable this power computing applications. Right, let's go back and proceed. So we, we basically have seen in step five now, um, we compile this, we have this executable. Now, how it could work that essentially this one one program, which is apparently the same program for all the different processors, is now executed remotely. And for this, we have this MPI run command that essentially now in this batch script, creating so-called four basically four different instantiations or let's say instances maybe on this hello program on these different processors. They all have the different memory. So we know basically we cannot access the other memory. And normally we would use message exchanges, but we don't do it here. But still we're interested in getting the rank information. And you see a little bit how that materializes here. So if you would run this, let's say with the information of running it on four processors with MPI run this hello would be basically executed on all the different four processors. So in a way, it's the same that we had already in practical lecture 1.1. Again, here is a small type O, right? But the difference is here now that you basically have created an MPI environment that is aware of the distributed nature of your application. If you compare it to practical lecture 1.1, uh, there obviously we basically had hello world and that's it. We didn't know exactly how many other processes were in my environment. Um, we didn't know who am I, basically. Am I, you know, just the first of this kind of group that was executed? Here you start perhaps understanding that with MPI, we have this environment now where the processors are well aware, you know, what identity they have in terms of the rank information that you see here. And of course, of being aware of how many other processes are actually with me in this whole parallel environment. And the scheduling script will determine how many of these processes are. So MPI run four is now just here an example. And of course, it's nice to have such a program like MPI run that is doing the distribution for us. Because think about it, if you would not have it and you would run perhaps 1,024 cores, jobs, and you would have to distribute this on all the different processes with a copy command or something that would be rather cumbersome. Also here, it should you tell you the story that um, in order to use all those processors now in parallel, there should be space for it. And we learned in the last lecture in practical lecture 1.1 that of course, um, 
there needs to be a scheduling alongside it. That's why we put this command inside a scheduler. And the scheduler will then make sure that no one else is basically using this processor right now. It's your dedicated parallel environment. And this is an important part, of course, of using again everything we learned before, basically with C programming and scheduling, now together with the MPI environment. And by basically using this um, in your different assignment and by the next subsequent lectures that will follow, you essentially have the idea of really um, understanding that much better. Um, there are little bit elements I want to allude to here and there where you think about this N, for instance, it's quite loaded here. A capital N is rather nodes, while N could be also in small standing for four different cores where the execution is happening. Um, essentially, then this MPI run is very um, important. You have seen in the video, you can do it on the command line perhaps and say MPI run NP4 basically or minus NP4 and then using this executable again. But of course, our idea is using the batch subscripts usually and not doing MPI run on your own command line. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is now that this is something which is now for all the different MPI jobs almost always the same. You change the executable, you change the amount of systems you need here, and we will see in later lectures also a wall time and that you can specify this much more in granular and, and so forth. But essentially the basic building blocks of submitting an MPI application is again, this one you see here. And from this, you're basically already ready of programming MPI and exploring these different, let's say, um, you know, the different functions that are there. And let us recap a little bit, of course, now how it works with a scheduler. Um, I think you will probably from practical lecture one one now remember very well, we have the so-called S batch command where we now use the scheduling script I was just explaining, um, this one here, and basically have locked in, of course, in the log in cluster using it from there. It will basically use the scheduler now with his basically scheduling script or batch script. This has different names. It's sometimes confusing for beginners. So some call it a batch subscript, a batch script, a, you know, parallel processing script, a scheduling script. But in the way, we all mean the same by that. And essentially, it will do the allocation of four different nodes or cores. It depends with minus n small. You have here rather cores. And we basically will look in this, of course, in practical lecture 2.1, much more in detail. What are the options here and so forth? But for the conceptual lecture here, it's probably good enough to know that essentially it's not so much changes from the previous practical lecture. Uh, of course, we have now a proper MPI program here so that then the output um, will be written to file at some point in time when the job is done. You can see this with QSTAT, if you remember, on the login node. Uh, because you will notice that if you remember from the last lecture, you don't get any output except just a job ID. So this output of what you know processor you are out of many will be not given back to you as usual in a kind of scheduling environment here with the MPI. It's the same way it will be delivered to some form of an output file, sometimes also an error file. And then basically you have you know a list perhaps here in your directory and see there's the executable, there's the C program, our nice batch script, and then several outputs from different applications that we maybe have submitted. And when you look into this, uh, no surprises, the MPI application has been probably uh, very nicely executed. But the nice thing now compared to the one that we had in the practical lecture 1.1 one, one, is now that we have a hello world with some form of an identity of a processor, right? You see here, hello world, I am one out of four. And um, it seems pretty much basic, but of course, it's also very powerful now to know and understand that this is really running in parallel and I have identity information with it. Um, as the output basically has here access to one file, it could be that the basically the kind of order here is up and down if you do the assignment, so don't worry about this. Or so sometimes two is in front, one is in front. Um, it doesn't matter. It's basically concurrent access to a file where all the four processors uh, have more or less race conditions to really write in this file. And that's why the order is not really deterministic. Uh, 
This is what I'm getting to. But it doesn't matter. It enables us to see that these four processes have created this in, uh, this MPI environment together, and we're aware of it because the size is four in this MPI com world. And they understood that with the rank information, I'm a unique processor. So we know as application developer that actually we can address this and use this information to create much more powerful programs, of course, in this hello world. But in fact, here and there, people will use this very simple statement with two out of four um, for debugging, of course, to also understand if all the MPI environment works properly and so forth. But obviously, we don't want to stop here and think now, fine, we have created an MPI environment and actually everybody was aware of it, <clears throat> but nobody was really using any interaction very much here. Perhaps the schedule a little bit to actually deploy the hello on all these different nodes uh, in the compute nodes, if you remember from YouTube. And this, if, if that would be all that MPI can do, we would not going to use it. Hence the name, message passing, right? So let's understand this message passing a bit more. What we really mean by this, um, how it is realized. Um, first of all, again, a recap we said basically. Um, we have in the top the MPI include file, and we are still very serial when we do this, right? There's no really parallel environments from MPI yet, unless we have this init statement that we have seen. And we have also this MPI finalized exit statement. And only in this, you can write basically between this and do the messages. Um, because the MPI environment will create something like these ranks for different processors and the yeah, communicators and so on. This is, of course, of our most importance because otherwise we don't know how to address the other processors. And <clears throat> you see also, once this power code ends, we are back in serial space. We cannot address the other processors anymore. The rank information is gone. We don't know anymore in the MPI environment. So how it then works with the messages obviously is a bit tricky because I told you earlier that Basically, it's the same program. So processor one and processor two have exactly the same MPI program. So that sounds weird, but is like that. And that means that the data you see here in this variable is, of course, essentially also here in this variable in the other processor, in the other process. But of course, in order to, to send it, we need basically receiving space for it, the system buffer space for it to be really being receiving and maybe rewriting then this data I have in this process B. And this message exchange like sent here will be prepared to send this data item over the network. But this also means you need a complementary processor that is actually listening and actually thinking that the send is a good idea and I do a receive. And that's where the real point to point communication starts. So. You have always, of course, in this part of the communication, two players, the send and receive. If basically a process sends a send without a matching receive, it will be waiting forever to send something because nobody is receiving. And vice versa, of course, if I receive and be ready for receive, but nobody is sending me something, then um, basically it is also not working. In other words, you can perhaps put it into real life if you play ball with a toddler. Right. If the toddler is ready to receive the ball, then it works. But if the toddler just throws the ball to you as a dad and you're knocked out by that, then, you know, basically you were not ready to receive. Again, a bit fun along the way, but this is essentially how point to point communication works and MPI at large. And we're actually in programming complex parallel applications could be sometimes errors because you will see lots of different codes which are much bigger with lots of if statements and, and so on in later uh, parts in this lecture. And then you can imagine that, of course, debugging these parallel codes brings us sometimes to, to situations like that. So let's see this again, um, basically from another perspective that um, here we have the idea with this point to point communication that we can use uh, essentially then this MPI environment to understand I want to send maybe from rank zero here to rank one and from rank two to rank three. Um, just as an example, and I know that I would program that and um, I would basically have always this construct with send and receive 
in order to make this happen and prepare, of course, also here on this receiving end that there will be, let's say, space in the system buffer for this new uh, variable coming in. And what I then do with this variable can be very different. As we have seen, we can reuse it maybe and make an addition to this data item here and so on, or do other elements with it, perhaps uh, depending on the parallel application. Good. So I think with this, we have understood essentially this um, send and receive from the conceptual perspective. Now, how that would look like when we have a real application. Of course, a real application is here again a little bit um, simplified. We're talking here about a very, very simple application. You see essentially here the ping and the pong with two processors, right? And um, Again, it, it seems so simple, but think about that. This means now this particular part of the problem is very similar. So we, we basically get the size information, the rank information we in it. We get here some MPI status back of message exchanges. I will go back uh, later. But you understand here in the flow the first time, hopefully, that we can now use essentially the rank information to understood who should be actually um, essentially the first receiver of the pink and who is sending the pink, right? Because the sender of the pink rank zero here will be having the first to be the sender. But with the pong, he also needs to be the receiver in the next part, right? So, and this is a role of rank zero here. Now, rank one is obviously the opposite around. So here we have MPI receive. So in the first time, in this time, and this is how the flow of the parallel program is, right? Down the timeline. And we see that the rank one must be this one because it has first the receive. And once it has the receive here in rank one, I will do, uh, basically it will do the send and we will with this initiate the pong while we hope at that time that actually the receive will be already reached by rank zero. So this shows you the nature of a parallel program, which is really important to understand. Although the nature um, of the whole MPI application is the same, it's the same MPI application in, indeed running there as an instance. But now we have the influence with this rank information to use if statements, for example, or switch or other let's say command, commands and you know, possibilities to, to initiate different program logic within this running MPI application. And this is all possible because we get this rank information dynamically in the runtime. Of course, I have to program before what I want to do in this dynamic runtime. So I need, of course, obviously, to think about a bit how I implement a ping pong. So this is not all automatic. Here I have to think about that rank zero has a different role than rank one. If both would be sending first and then receiving, we will have two pings and no pongs because nobody will ever come to the situation of doing a pong because both will send. And as nobody is listening, this MPI program function will never be successful. Um, and with this coming a little bit to successful and messages here, you see, for instance, receive has this status where you can nicely see how many chars have been actually received. And you see also that, of course, for knowing where to send, I need basically to, to think about um, where essentially do I uh, basically send to. And the same is true for the destination. And this is an interesting flow of the program and we will execute it and whereby now everybody thinks, well, that is very simple, just to have an X over the wire with ping pong, we will see that you can quickly have an interesting situation, um, you know, by, by quickly getting it wrong already in a very small application like here to understand the parallel in nature. Left alone, if you go to really big programs that we have an MPI, of course, when we use, for instance, starting collectives and so forth. So, as I said, in practical lecture 2.1, we come back to these. Um, and I also want to just give a short appetizer for practical lecture 2.1 again, because we will also use, of course, collective functions with broadcast as an example, but also with the others. If you remember, this is sending data from one processor to all the others. 
basically and the same data to all the others. So here's an example of a C function that does exactly this, where you basically can now uh, start and see that we get here again the rank information and you specify basically that um, the source will be this rank zero processor. And if it's equal, you know, then I would basically fill the buffer. So initiating the buffer, um, in other words, only this will be executed by this first processor and is only needed only to be initialized by this first processor because then of course we said that here from the source, which is zero will be this broadcast initiated and then we'll send the buffer essentially to all the different other processors in the MPI COM world, as I specify here as a communicator. I can use another communicator, but you also see that they here don't need a destination, nor address exactly which rank I address, because essentially this is in the communicator space. And then of course I can see for all the different processors that by then should hopefully get something in the buffer and can prove that because this will be only executed by, let's say, rank zero, we can prove with this statement that all other ranks also got information. So essentially you see, we're getting to more and more powerful functions, but as I said, also, this will be much more elaborated in the practical lecture 2.1 with real application, uh, you know, examples on the real HPC machine, much more interesting. To basically conclude this lecture, this conceptual idea of really using practical MPI, there's another interesting video which shows you here again, also an emphasis on essentially collective operation, but then also actually understanding what the difference between computing P in a Pi in serial and parallel using MPI for Pi again. In this final section, we will take a closer look to collective communication. MPI includes several communication patterns for collective communication. The first pattern of interest is broadcasting. This is the case where one process will send a message to every other processes inside the communicator. A second pattern of interest is scatter. In this case, one process will split its message into several parts and send individual parts to different processes. A pattern related to scatter is gather. It is the inverse process of scatter, where different portions of a message are put back together from several processes. An extension to gather is the MPI all gather, where the gathering process is done for all processes. In this mode, each process ends up with the overall information. MPI also includes collective communication methods to merge values from several processes. For example, the function MPI reduce reduces several values to a single value. The function will apply a reduce operation. In this example, the reduce operation is MPI sum, which simply sums all values into a single value sent back to the process zero. Many other reduce operations can be applied, including min, max, product, the logical end, etc. To illustrate how to use collective communication patterns, we will proceed with the example of computing pi. There are many algorithms to compute pi. In this example, we will use the following approximation using a summation. As we will increase delta x in this formula, we will get closer and closer to the real value of pi. As you can imagine, as we increase the number of steps in this computation, the longer it will take to be computed, especially in a serial manner. In such a case, it is possible to split the summation over multiple processes to accelerate the computation. So first, let's compute pi in a serial manner. This will be done by simply looping over the number of steps and updating the summation result each step. Finally, we evaluate pi. We also evaluate the computation time and report it at the end. So let's look how long it takes to compute 100 million steps. <laughs> 
In this case, it took about 30 seconds to compute on an interactive node on S star. Now, let's build our MPI version. As usual, we first collect information about the MPI COM world to retrieve the rank and size of each process. We also evaluate the number of steps that will be handled by each process and compute the start and end boundaries. Then, each process will compute its section of pi in the for loop. The main difference here with the serial version is that the loop will become smaller and smaller as we add processes. This is a classic divide and conquer method common in computer science. Finally, for this function, we return the partial sum. What remains to be done is the main function. Here, we make use of the MPI reduce function. In there, we will execute the function that we just defined in the previous slide with all available processes and apply the reduce operation sum. Once everything is complete, we will print the result. And that's it. Let's now execute this code to see if it's faster than our previous test. And, indeed, while splitting over 14 processes, it took only about 6 seconds. Alright, so coming back to our lectures, I think it was also a good um, short example of how you can see the motivation is um, basically to use MPI, right? We have seen the speed up uh, from a serial version of uh, computing pi to a parallel version of using pi. And obviously, the more computing you put to this problem, uh, the faster you would be. However, we will also learn in subsequent lecture that there are, of course, limits to the speed ups. Uh, things like Amdahl's law, um, we will elaborate much more when it comes to parallelization theory and, and interesting you know, performance characteristics. But essentially, this sums up um, the idea of using this collective operation that we will significantly use in this course and later on also in our assignments. So finally, um, as an appetizer, again, practical lecture 2.1 will basically take a lot of this material we've seen today and will execute this on a real HPC system. And with this, you basically have all the know-how for getting to our first assignment and solve it. Thank you very much and see you in practical lecture 2.1.